yours. I know they're yours. I'm not fixing anything today, just so you know. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, it's kind of a cold morning, but the sun's shining. That's a good thing. I uh, have a few new faces here. If, if you get a chance, shake some hands. Give a hug. Hey, COVID's over, right? <laughs> I don't know about that. And we're not going to go there. <laughs> Let's pray. Dear Father God, we love you and we thank you. We thank you for this day. We thank you for each one that's here. Lord, we just ask that you have your way in the service today. We ask that pastor's message be one that we can apply to our lives and that we can share with others. Lord, we ask for the courage and the wisdom and the knowledge to speak of you, um, to speak boldly, but to also be kind and, and, and gracious towards, towards those who don't know you, Lord. And we pray for your blessings over the tithes and offerings that have been given. We ask that they be used to increase your kingdom. The king looked at him and said, well, how about you? Are you guilty? He said, yes, sir, I am. And the king told the jailer, get him out of here. He'll corrupt all these innocent people. <laughs> During his ministry, Jesus explained that he said, I have come to call not those who think they're righteous, but those who know they are sinners. He knew that we had to be willing to see our condition in order for us to get help. We have to be willing to admit we're sinners before we can be forgiven. And he made it clear that his reason for coming to the earth was to connect people to his father, to help them to, to belong where they where they were meant to belong. He said, the Son of Man came to seek and to save those who are lost. The seeking is him taking the initiative, him making the effort, him coming to us. And that's what Christmas is. God didn't just sit in heaven and say, well, I hope they figure it out. Jesus came to be one of us so that we could understand exactly what we needed. And the reason we have Christmas is that he came to bring our world back to God. He came to bring individuals back to God. The angels announced his purpose the night he was born, remember? For unto you is born this day in the city of David, what? A Savior, which is Christ the Lord. He came to save us. He came to make a difference. He came to get us out of trouble with God. And that is something to celebrate, isn't it? Well, this week, many of us have finished reading the book of Acts. We're reading through the New Testament this school year, and we came to the last half of the Acts, and we read earlier in the book that Jesus, after he rose from the dead, hung around for about six weeks, teaching the disciples, showing them how they fit into God's plan, getting them ready to carry on the mission he had for them. And then he returned to heaven, and he told them, this is a good thing that I'm going to be gone because Jesus, when he was born, was born into a body like we are. He could be one place at a time. But when he went back to heaven, he sent the Holy Spirit who could be everywhere all the time. And so we're worshiping here and over across town, this way and that way, others are worshiping and he's in every fellowship where he's welcome. He's with those who are in the hospital or rest homes or at work. He's He's able to minister to all our needs all the time, everywhere we go. And so he sent the Holy Spirit to do that, and he's been doing it ever since, and he's drawing people to Jesus as Savior. You see, Jesus can save anyone from their sins. I remember a man who committed murder. I was visiting him in jail. He said, could I ever be forgiven? I didn't have to think about it. Because I know what the Bible says. Of course you can be forgiven. Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. There, he paid the penalty for every sin. Now there's some people we don't like. Maybe they're someone in history. Maybe they're somewhere, somewhere in the world. Maybe it's your boss at work. I don't know. But there's some people we think, oh, I don't know if they ever could get right with God. But Jesus can save anyone. And he can save any of us. In fact, we need him to. And he came to show us that it was possible. 
One of the things the Holy Spirit does is he shows us how bad our sin is. We tend to make excuses. We tend to think, well, it's not that bad. And the Holy Spirit shows us, no, your sin is serious. It's terminal. It's doing more damage to people than you ever realize. It's keeping you from God. You need to repent and be done with that sin. And the Holy Spirit will show us that. And he'll lead us to repentance. We repent by saying that we're sorry. Not just saying it, but by being sorry. I'm sorry I did that. Not just that somebody knows it. Not just that I have this consequence. I'm sorry I did that. I'm sorry for the offense that I brought to God. I'm sorry for the damage I've done to people. And I don't want to do that anymore. I don't want to go back to that. I don't want that to be the way I operate in the future. That's what repentance is. It's making a U-turn. It's letting God make us right and um, replace what we do wrong with what is right. Not everybody's willing. I've gone to see people who knew they were dying, who, who actually did die within a day or two of the, when I saw them, and they didn't want to talk about God. And uh, I remember one fellow from history named Jonathan Weil. Uh, Jonathan uh, lived uh, outwardly a respectable life. He was kind of a, a pillar of the community, but he was running a side business where he was a crime boss, and he had these gangs of robbers all over England who were stealing stuff. And he was, he was kind of fencing it all. He was kind of getting it uh, into the legitimate world, making money and paying people. And uh, he finally got caught uh, and found guilty of part of his crime and sentenced to be hanged. This was uh, back when hanging was pretty popular in England. And so the day of his hanging, there were all kinds of people wanted to come see this famous robber die. And he seemed to enjoy the attention. He got up there with a big smile. And they, they put a noose around his neck. And the priest came up to do the last rites for him. And while the priest was praying, Jonathan picked his pocket. And as the priest turned to go down, he waved triumphantly what he had just stolen. But then they pulled the lever. And Jonathan Wilde found out the truth of Scripture. It is a terrible thing to fall into the hands of the living God. It's a wonderful thing to rest in the hands of the living God. It's a beautiful thing to come to the shepherd of our souls. But it's a terrible thing to come to God as a judge and to be a rebel. How much better it is to face God now, to admit that my sin is real, that it's bad, to ask forgiveness, and to become right with God. You can go from being a rebel to being a child of God in a minute's time by just leveling with him, and just surrendering to him, just bowing to him. And that's what he's looking for. He takes no satisfaction in serving as our judge. The Bible says he does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. He came to make forgiveness possible, and that's what he hopes we'll do. He's come for that. He puts salvation right there within our reach, if we'll just take it. If we'll put ourselves in his hand. And when we come to him, when we come to Jesus, the Bible says that we're saved. The Bible says that we're redeemed. It says we're born again. We're transformed. We're made sons and daughters of God. There's a lot of ways to describe it, but there's only one way for it to happen, and that is to have an encounter with Jesus Christ. And when we do, it'll change everything. So we have a choice to make. This is the ultimate truth of life. We have a choice to make about how we will respond to God and to the Savior that he sent to us. And our response to Jesus will determine our relationship with God every day and it will establish our eternal destiny. Whether we live in God's presence or away from his presence forever depends on 
what we do about Jesus. So will we humble ourselves? Will we come to the Creator and ask forgiveness for where we've gone away from His plan? Will we let Him take charge and make us what He created us to be? That's the ultimate question in life. It's a whole lot more important than where you live or what you drive or where you work or anything, isn't it? It's the key issue. And so coming to Jesus means we repent. That we say, I'm sorry and I want to be saved. Some people won't admit they need saving. I'm fine the way I am. Well, you can't humble yourself if you're already thinking everything's fine. And so we need that. And that's how you become a Christian. You bow before Jesus Christ. You ask forgiveness. You say, make me what you want me to be. We're not saved by coming to church. We're saved by coming to Christ. Amen? And it has happened to most of us. It has happened to millions of people. It's happened to every generation since Jesus lived on the, in this world. And the book of Acts gives us several examples of people who surrendered. And the, one of them is a man named Saul. We know him as Paul. His name was changed. Paul was a well-educated man. He was a Roman citizen, so he had privileges most people didn't have. He was a, a Jewish man who was an, in the highest caliber of uh, following the law. He was very religious, and yet he had no clue how far he was from God. He thought he was doing great. He actually was doing the opposite of what God wanted, and he thought he was doing the right thing. It happens. It's happening in our generation. And of all the events in the New Testament, the one that's spoken of in the most detail is the death and resurrection of Jesus. When you read the Gospels, as many of you have done in the last few months, you'll see that a, a third or more of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is about the last week of Jesus' life. It tells us uh, how he died, how he rose again. And so that's the most detail. Now you come to say, what's the second most spoken about event? It's the conversion of Saul. Of all the things that happened in the New Testament, the conversion of Saul is the second most detailed account. In the book of Acts, you read about it three times. The time it happened, and two times when Paul tells what happened. And we're going to look at that today. In fact, right now, I'd like for you to watch as we read this section or have it read to us from Acts chapter 26. I too was convinced that I ought to do all that was possible to oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth, and that is just what I did in Jerusalem. On the authority of the chief priests, I put many of the saints in prison. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. Many a time, I went from one synagogue to another to have them punished, and I tried to force them to blaspheme. In my obsession against them, I even went to foreign cities to persecute them. On one of these journeys, I was going to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. About noon, O king, as I was on the road, I saw a light from heaven brighter than the sun, blazing around me and my companions. We all fell to the ground, and I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. Then I asked, who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. The Lord replied, now, get up and stand on your feet. I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and as a witness of what you have seen of me and what I will show you. I will rescue you from your own people 
and from the Gentiles. I am sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So then, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven, first to those in Damascus, then to those in Jerusalem and in all Judea, and to the Gentiles also. I preached that they should repent and turn to God and prove their repentance by their deeds. That is why the Jews seized me in the temple courts and tried to kill me. But I have had God's help to this very day. And so I stand here and testify to small and great alike. I am saying nothing beyond what the prophets and Moses said would happen. It goes on. The Christ would but suffer. This is Paul and talking as to the first King Agrippa, to explaining how God changed his life. He made a U-turn one day. As he lay on the ground, it must have been a shock to him. He must have just felt the shock flow through his body to realize he was hearing from Jesus. This person that he thought couldn't have risen from the dead was alive. This one that he thought was a pretender was the Messiah who could save the world. And he was talking to Paul. And suddenly, he went from threatening believers to becoming one of them. He went from fighting against Jesus to serving him. He went from doing what he thought was best to yielding to what God knew was right. He was a different man. Knocked flat and struck blind, Paul finally was ready to listen. He was ready to change. And from that day on, he not only followed Jesus, he tried to help others do the same. He showed them uh, what the Bible said, how Jesus fulfilled prophecy, and what he had done for others. He tried to convince them to follow him. He explained it later in this way. He said, so we tell others about Christ, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all the wisdom God has given us. We want to present them to God, perfect in their relationship to Christ. That's why I work and struggle so hard, depending on Christ's mighty power that works within me. Paul became a new man that day with a new understanding, with new values, with a new mission. He became what God intended him to be when God created him. And it can happen to anybody. It needs to happen to everybody. It's how we become friends of God instead of rebels against him. It's why Jesus came to become a human being and was born in Bethlehem. He came to make Paul a child of God. He came to make every one of us children of God. He offers us a life of purpose and meaning where we, we're right with God, we're, we're okay. And God leads us day by day in the plan that he has for us. And when we walk with Jesus, we'll do it until we take our last breath, and then we'll just change location and do it forever. We'll be his forever. The biggest question in life is, have you accepted Jesus' invitation? Have you said yes to him? Have you let him forgive your sins? He wants to, he's willing to, he's ready to. The, the price is paid, but he waits for us to say, yes, I, I, I want that, I need that. And are you willing to let him be in charge? To say, I'm not just going to do whatever I want, I'm going to do what I'm here to be, God put me here to do, how to serve him. And that will make the difference in how you live every day, won't it? It'll make the difference in where you live forever. I'm not sure if everyone here has accepted Christ, so I'm going to ask you if you pray with me today. And if you're not sure you belong to Jesus, if you're not sure your sins have been forgiven, if you're not sure you're on the right course with God, I'm going to invite you to give your life to Jesus right now to make sure if you're not sure. 
that you belong to God through Christ. Would you pray with me? I'm going to invite you in the quietness of the room and in, within your own mind to just quietly repeat these words or, or something like them and give your heart to Jesus. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you that you love me. You came into this broken world to be my Savior. You lived a perfect life. You died an awful death. You rose triumphantly to save everyone who turns to you. Jesus, I'm coming to you today. Please forgive my sins, all those things I've done that you didn't want me to do. Please take charge of my life. Show me how to be the person you made me to be and live for the purpose you gave me to live for. I give myself to you with gratitude. In Jesus' name, amen. If that's your prayer, if that's your desire, if that's what you want, you're agreeing with God because he wanted it for you. And he'll make you the person you were created to be. You'll live forever in his presence. You'll enjoy it. Don't worry about getting bored. Heaven is where the creator of the universe lives. There's no boredom there. There's only energy. And that's where it all comes from. And he wants to have us enjoy it with him forever. Amen. This time in our service, we're going to turn to the Lord's table, to communion. This is something Jesus gave his disciples. He sat down with them the night before he died, just hours before he was arrested. And he said to them, well, he said a lot of things. John 13, 14, 15, and 16 are all the things he said to them that night at that table. But he gave them the the Last Supper that they enjoyed together, the Lord's Table that we come to. It's being celebrated all around the world today in churches. Some observe it once a month like we do. Some observe it every service. Some observe it some other way. But it's the, it's the meal that he gave us to remember him by. He laid down his life so that we could have life, so that we could come to life through him. And he wanted them to remember how it happened. There was a little boy who went to his cousins out in the country. And uh, the, the mom of the country family uh, sent one of her older kids and, and this younger boy went with them out to, the, to get some eggs. So they went out to the hen house. And he watched uh, curiously while his cousin reached under chickens and pulled out eggs and, and put them in a basket. He, collected several when the little boy said, why do you keep your eggs out here? We put ours in the fridge. <laughs> well, he didn't quite understand how it worked yet. But there's a lot of things where we're still figuring out how it works, aren't we? And one of them is the spiritual life. There's all kinds of ideas out there what it means to be spiritual, what it means to, to know God. And uh, a lot of smart people, a lot of not so smart people have ideas. But the Bible tells us, the Bible shows us what God says. It really is the word of God. It really was given to us from God. It really does point us every time to a Savior. When you read the Old Testament, it points ahead. This is what God is going to do. When you read the New Testament, it says this is what he came and did. And when you get to the prophecies about the end of the world, it says this is what's going to make the difference. This is who wins. And this is who celebrates with them, those who follow Jesus. And so we come to this table. And we're going to worship him together. And so I'm going to ask our servers to come. And we're going to distribute both the bread and the cup. I'm going to ask you just to hold on to them. And while they're serving, uh, we're going to have a video to watch. And so uh, we'll have you do that.
If you are struggling with vision problems, add half a teaspoon of this to a glass. One of the biggest mistakes we make is underestimating the tragedy of sin, the damage that it does, the difference that it makes, the division it causes, not just between people, but between us and God. Isaiah said, your sin has separated you from God. And it has to be punished. There has to be justice. God, God is just. It's, we all have something in us that wants justice. And uh, Jesus said, I will bring justice. I will take the punishment that people deserved. And he did it in his own body. And he gave us this bread and he said, when you, when you have this, I want you to remember how my body was broken for you, how, how it was crushed, how it was brutalized because of sin. And I want you to I want you to be thankful that there's a way of forgiveness. And so let's take this with gratitude. He said this cup would remind us of his blood. The Bible says the life is in the blood. We just had the Red Cross here a couple days ago, collecting blood. Several people from our church came. And that blood literally will save lives. It literally will keep someone alive who otherwise would perish. 
And Jesus said his blood would change the whole world. It would, it would bring forgiveness to anyone. It would bring eternal life to everyone who took, um, took it on themselves. Not the physical blood of Jesus, but the fact that he shed his blood for us. And this grape juice, which they would have had all the time, every meal in Israel at that time, this was to remind them of what he had done. He said, take this in remembrance of me. Let's do that. And Lord Jesus, we're grateful that you cared. You had the whole universe. There was just this problem on earth. You could have just ended it here, 